Hey, so good Sam here. So I thought I would do a short video explaining something that uh, comes up a fair bit with students and, and in general uh, talking to people about kind of the, the way I draw and uh, linear drawing in general. So particularly with brushwork, but with most linear art, something you'll see a lot is a uh, varying line weight, all right? That's a feathered line. Now, a lot of people wonder about how do you use that? You know, basic rule of thumb is that anything on the page, any line you make, contains information. Um, there's expressive information about uh, the dynamic energy of the line. For example, um, there's directional information, so coming in and going somewhere and the line will have a feeling of sort of directional energy. There's applied uh, force, as Michael Matisse describes it. So when you have a curve like that, it feels like there's an applied force pushing out. Um, that was not a very good example. That's a better one. Um, and so like if you have somebody bunging, wow, right? That's like the action line for the punch. And the arc of the line and even the character of the line helps suggest the movement of the, the hand through space. Um, but when you're drawing, for example, let's say you have an arm, right? And you now it's time to ink your arm or render it. You can do this with pencil lines as well. Uh, it's become quite popular these days too do something in pencil and either keep the subtle quality of pencil or then boost the, the values in Photoshop so that you now have uh, a high contrast line that looks sort of inked. I still like the old-fashioned way with ink because that's sort of how I got into working and I'm comfortable with it and I don't particularly uh, enjoy working digitally. I, I still like working on paper. So ink is the way I go. But be it with a pen I'll grab a pen to demonstrate some of this with that too. Or with a brush. Why and when do you vary line weight? So there's a couple of classical rules of thumb. In my own work, just to say up front, I'm not super consistent. I kind of go a bit willy-nilly about it. Some of the times it's just for expression, a little bit more sinewy quality to the line. But I always try to have it contribute something. It's not completely random. Um, but just to say that I don't necessarily follow these classical rules to the letter of the law. However, let's start with those. So, um, if you were to just render this with a continuous line of the same weight and value all the way around, the, the line would be somewhat flat. Uh, the, the curve and, and contours of the shape could be fairly expressive, but the line itself wouldn't be adding an additional, uh, amount of information by having a varying value. And uh, in comics, this is called the clear line style. Hergé, who did Tintin, is famous for uh, clear line work. And if you look at his work, you'll notice that the line values are not completely flat, but they're very close to being consistent and sort of creates an open, clean look. And that can work too. Uh, but then if you look at other artists, there's a whole spectrum all the way at the other extreme with Kirby, where you have these big, chunky, crazily expressive lines, but they were very, um, I don't know, like primitive, but architectural and, and seemed to be made out of primal materials almost. Um, and in between that, you have the full range. Uh, so the classical rules I was going to mention, you either have thicker lines where there's more meat and thinner lines where the bone is. So here you have an elbow, you would have a thin line there and a thicker line where the muscle is the largest on the arm. So see, the little wrist bone gets thinner. Knuckles thin, around the palm, a little thicker around the bicep, but not super thick. You may want to, if you want to make it feel like that muscle's bigger, you do that, a little more weight. Thin at the bone again, out, like that. So that's one approach. And you can see how it sort of could sell the idea of 
the weight of the mass of the meat of the body. So uh, if someone has a large belly, perhaps, right? You would do it like this. Lighter on top a bit, but... That kind of thing. So the other rule of thumb is the line helps express highlight and shadow. So let's start with a fresh sheet. Say you again have the arm. a little bigger to make this job easier. I'm not going to try and make this too pretty because just to illustrate a point. And say our light source is here. Okay? That means this side is in shadow and that's somewhat in shadow and these have highlights on them. So now you want the thicker line on the bottom to indicate the shadow and a thin line, relatively speaking, on top to help indicate the source. So now this cut tucks in so it goes a little thick and then thinner. I'll make it a little thicker there. And then generally thick on this side. So now the line is telling us about light. Without, I haven't even gotten into drawing any shadows yet and already I'm communicating something about the light source. Um, and then the third, uh, kind of not so classical art oriented, but the third kind of early rule that I picked up, which for me came from comic art, was that it can tell you something about distance. So say this arm appears to be fairly close by, and we're going to have a person in the distance here trying to get their attention. Hey! Right? Well, then you would uh, render that person in thin lines. By comparison. Okay, it's very silly, but you get the idea. Now, why would you do this? Well, the simple principle is that, in theory, the line weight is kind of like a part of the person, and so if they go further away, the lines get smaller because they get smaller. So it's helping to represent distance and depth. Uh, it also kind of is similar to the atmospheric effect, which is that uh, in color or tonal work, you have... Uh, no pure blacks or pure whites at the very in the distance because atmosphere grays out everything. Uh, in color, it would blue out everything, so everything would uh, develop a blue hue, and your pure blacks would become uh, uh, less pure black. They would actually become a, a tonal value with some blue in it. Um, and you could you could suggest smoke by using other colors other than blue. Um, and that would tell you that it's something other than just air in the way. And if you have um, a, a quicker, you'd also with smoke, you'd have a quicker gradation into tonal values that are not pure white or pure black because the air is denser. So it interferes with the travel of light quicker. Um, this effect is kind of sort of saying the same thing, that the, the line isn't going to be as strong and because they're further away, it's smaller. You know, these are the very the rationales for it, but it, when people look at it and uh, just quickly on the page and any of these examples um they're not d thinking that way they're going to pick up the information unconsciously uh but it's still fairly effective it, it it's the line values are going to do something on the page and if you're using any medium where and even with a pen you're going to get some variation in line potentially right so i can get a fair bit of variation best to use that with intent and expressiveness, rather than just let it be random messiness. Um, so you apply it in a way, hopefully, that's more informed. Um, for my work, I do actually incorporate a bit of messiness. It's kind of a stylistic choice frequently. But um, if you look at 
I'll pull out a couple examples. Um, this is my book, Dream Life. So here we're using, I've got a very heavy line compared to work you'll see on another page because we're very close to these characters. So I'm, I'm doing a big graphic heavy line and then it gets a little uh, thinner on some of the curves and things like that to help express the form, but it's generally very heavy. Uh, let's find some examples of something else. Let's see. There's a good example here of... Well, there you go. So, it's not a lot, but there's a slight variation. The lines here are a bit heavier than out here at the end of the horn, which is further away. Plus, also, I'm going to a point. This is another thing that I use it for. So, now we've, we've covered those first three core things. You've got distance, light value, and then the the amount of mass or meat on the muscle. Um, now, kind of extrapolating away from the idea of the, the amount of meat or mass on the muscle is uh, using it to ex sh uh, highlight or express curves. Um, you know, like, let's do a couple of curves. Or a point. Um, and uh, using the expressive line to help illustrate that. So if the line varies in harmony with the curvature, it helps make an, a more expressive sinew, sinuousness to the line. Um, and if you time where these variations in the thickness happen, you can sell the idea, like sort of that fat man's belly, for example, instead of just making it thick where the meat is thickest, you can actually make the belly seem fatter even, if it goes out and comes thin at the edge. So it's almost like the it's pushing out, it's thinning out the line even, to make that belly super fat, right? Um, and by contrast, you can use it to sort of create the directional value I mentioned before, like this, to the line, uh, sort of send your eye somewhere or you can use it to you know put it there these will all all these kind of different positionings of where the thick and the thin is will actually tell you something about the form it's describing inside and amplify or or, or accentuate various curves so there are slight variations on this hand for example that make the the line describing the top of the hand feel like it has even more variations in its shape than it really does. It's just actually getting thicker and thin. And it tells you about the shape inside in ways that if it had just been a consistent line, it would seem kind of flat and have less information in it. Um, and then so for points. So, you know, if typically if you're just trying to draw a point like this, one thing about that is it's, it's kind of hard to make it seem very sharp. So something I do often is even go with an outright loss line, so a gap. It's tricky. There we go. If I do that, I can make the line feel needle sharp at the tip. It's so fine that you can't see it anymore. Uh, and I'll have things like that. So say that we have a back of a car. Here's the back, and here's the hood. And where they meet, I'll have a little gap. Um, I'll throw up an illustration. I think it's got a, a couple good examples of that. And that can be a good way of having kind of like a highlight and or overlapping. If you have forms that are um, overlapping, for example, like let's say if you look at the top of most old vans, they often have this sort of lip on the roof. And this is how I often handle that kind of information. This is a shadow there, and that. So this lightness here helps sell that curve, and also the feeling that this sort of wraps around to the other side by having that little gap and a bit of lost line effect. So these are all ways you can use the line weight to have a more expressive line. Um, it can also be kind of random and, and scrabble and all over the place. It doesn't have to be super consistent and, and neat. I'm not. Um, you know, that's a tidier drawing, but let's see. I'm sure we can find... Oh, there's some messy stuff. See? And 
the line variations here aren't very consistent, but they all help a sell this moment. So play with your line weights a bit and experiment and think about, observe how they inform the illustration and change the way you see things. You have this stuff done with pencil rather than ink. It always has an effect. It's a good thing to explore. That's it. Go draw, have fun. Uh, check out my Patreon page. Sal Good Sam out. Have a, a lovely weekend.